Confessions of a Disgruntled Spy by Slobodan Radoyev Mitri Chapter 9 On the Trail of Vlado Dapchevich Two months after the murder of the Yugoslav ambassador Rolavic in Sweden, I received a telegram from my boss Gukovic to return to Yugoslavia immediately. Upon my return, I had to solve many problems. When everything was resolved, I was ordered to return to Sweden and pay Vladimir Bagvik a visit. I was told to tell you him that I was Daptovic's agent, that I had worked for a long time within that group and to record the entire conversation. I arrived in Stockholm at the beginning of September 1971. I was ordered to investigate the emigrants who were coming from England to Sweden to open casinos here. I soon found out that the head of that group was a certain Obrad, born in Nice, with the nickname Barter. Barta had been an emigrant for a long time. He helped many Serbian national organizations and nobody suspected that he and his men were secret service agents. Together with one of them, a man named Dusan Sekulic, and with Ringo and his brother Rajko, we opened a casino called Montenegro. I met Vladimir Bagvik as ordered. He told me he knew about the connection that the leadership of the Communist Party in Croatia had with Croatian emigrants. He asked me to pay him thousands of kronen in order to give me the names of the people from Yugoslavia who were connected with emigration. I recorded everything he said and immediately sent it to headquarters. In October of that same year, there was an attempt to murder Dusan Sekulic in the Montenegro club. I disarmed the assassin at once and I locked him up in a room of the basement of the club that we used for our meetings. The assassin's name was Tomislav Rebrina. He admitted his guilt at once. I hardly managed to save him from Dusko Sekulic, who wanted to kill him right away. Dusko didn't know what I knew. Rebrina confessed that he was working on orders from the Secret Service from Osijek and that it wasn't the first time that he had tried to commit a murder. He also confessed to me that he worked for many years as a Secret Service agent from Osijek and that all that time he was a member of the Croatian extremist organizations abroad. He added that the Swedish Secret Service had a connection to the group in Osijek and that Igram von Olsen was at that moment present in Osijek. I recorded Rebrina's entire speech. While Ringo was standing guard at the door of the basement to bar Sekulic from entering, he was furious and tried to kill Rebrina again. At about 5 o'clock in the morning, I took Rebrina to the Swedish police and accused him of attempting to kill Dusko Sekulic in the Montenegro club. The next day, I was asked to come to the Swedish secret police called SEPO. They were most of all interested in what I did with a letter I had found on Rebrina's person. I pretended not to know anything about it. A month later, I was present at Rebrina's trial but didn't testify against him on orders of my boss. Rebrina was sentenced to two months in prison. The Swedish secret police started investigating me more and more and tried in all possible ways to get me to work for them. They said they wanted me to be their karate trainer and tried all sorts of tricks to get me on their side. One of their tricks was to accuse me of breaking the law because I had slept with a girl who was a minor. Later on, I found out that for more than a year that girl had been out on the streets and sleeping with many men before me. My relationship with that teenage Swedish girl was considered rape and I was forced to appear in court, instead of rape. I was sentenced to prison on account of the 18 fights I had been involved in at the clubs where I worked as a security guard. It was a form of coercion against me to join the Swedish police and work for them. While in prison I wrote two books, The Belgrade Underworld and Bible for a Man Without Faith. This last book dealt with my generation, which was left to its own destiny and no longer believed in anything. Ringo did his military service in Yugoslavia. I received a letter from him to get in touch with my uncle. That was our secret code, uncle, being Marko Milunovic from Sweden, Vlado Dapchevich we always called, wizard. 
I wrote to Marko Milunovic and I sent him a recording of Serbian songs. Milunovic wrote me back, thanking me for the record. He didn't suspect that I would soon be preparing to kill him. I was ordered by Gukovic to lure him to Uppsala. I wondered why I should go to Uppsala, when I could just as easily eliminate him in Vestieras. I wrote Milunovic a letter from Uppsala, signing as Radola Kovacevic. My boss Gukovic had sent me a passport under that name. Milunovic answered my letter, but as a cautious emigrant refused to come to Uppsala. My bosses in Yugoslavia considered that to be my failure and punished me severely. I was ordered to destroy all the material I had with me and to immediately return to Yugoslavia. When I got back to my country, Obrad Gukovic welcomed me in a most unfriendly manner, not even wanting to shake hands with me. Instead of greeting me, he said, you have come. Traitor, it wasn't the same Gukovic anymore, who flattered me and glorified my spying prowess. He ordered me strictly not to leave Belgrade and to await further orders there. While I was thus waiting in Belgrade, he slyly organized a cowardly attack on me. A group of his men beat me up one night in Skardalia, hitting me from behind on the head with a brick and causing a wound that bled profusely. Maybe his revenge on me would have even been more severe. Had my father not personally approached our cousin Rados Nedek, a high official of the Secret Service from Novi Sad, Rados Nedek inquired extensively about my work and finally, as my cousin, decided to help me by giving me one more chance to go back to Sweden and to correct my mistakes there. They would first send me to Holland and then again to Sweden to kill Stipe Mikulic and another Croatian. For that purpose he gave me a passport under the new name Jurik Obrad. He also told me that Marko Milunovic was no longer considered dangerous, that the information about him was not true and that he even knew what Milunovic was having for breakfast. Nedek later changed his plan a little. He gave me 3,000 German marks and ordered me to travel immediately to Holland and then to Oslo in Norway, where he would wait for me in Hotel de Ribo. I arrived in Holland in the middle of September 1973. From there, I went on to Norway where I met Nedek with some delay, because my car had broken down. Nedek ordered me to return to Holland to try again to become friends with his agent Sasako Lakovic, and arranged a new meeting for us in Holland, while waiting for Rados Nedek. I went one day to restaurant Boomerang in Amsterdam where I met two young men by accident. One of them was called Bakka and the other one Marco, both of them were Macedonian. They revealed a secret to me, namely that they were there as tourists, which meant that they were criminals. We became friends and they were started working for me, by accident. These two men were to be with me when the powerful UDBA secret service attempted to kill me. Finally, my new boss Rados Nedek arrived. He took me to a secluded restaurant and solemnly declared that they had decided that I should go to Brussels to kill Vlado Dapcevic. Hearing that I had been chosen to kill Vlado Dapcevic made me tremendously happy. Melting with pride, I thought that if I were to succeed in this, all the wishes for my future would be fulfilled. He told me to find Bora Blagajevic in Brussels, who owned a cafe called Sarajevo, and that this man would connect me with Vlado Dapcevic. I even received Vlado Dapcevic's phone number. When I phoned Dapcevic for the first time, I told him, as was agreed with Nedic, that my name was Zoran Jovanovic and that I was sending him greetings from Slobodan Kovacevic and Milan Zuban from Romania. That was sufficient for Dapcevic. He immediately made an appointment with me to visit him at his apartment. Nedek sent me his courier with a gun, a Colt revolver. Everything was ready and the fulfillment of a great dream was within reach. The courier who had brought me the gun also said that Nedek ordered me to go to Brussels alone, on December 16, 1973. 
He also ordered me to visit Dapchevich and to shoot him when he opened the door, and not to escape to Holland, as planned earlier, but to Munich. He would wait for me at an appointed place. This change rendered me very suspicious. Why was I supposed to go to Brussels alone? I began to suspect that maybe Niedek wanted to have me killed there together with Dapchevich. It made me extremely angry, but hid it from Nedek's courier. Reluctantly managing to overcome my emotions, I decided to go to Brussels to commit that murder. To eliminate all suspicion and to prove to them that I was no traitor. Asterisk asterisk asterisk.